Great glowing day, Adam's children. I didn't expect to make this sermon for you all, but I wanted to get this analysis out as quickly as I could with the release of the new Fallout TV trailer, and combine it with the information that was released in the new Vanity Fair article that was also recently released, and gives plot context that will help bolster my trailer analysis. I hope you are as excited as I am, and like with all my videos, please give me your thoughts, opinions, and your own analyses of what we currently know about the upcoming TV show. Crank up the rads and let's pick this trailer apart scene by scene for references, hints, easter eggs, and mysteries for the show we are eager to see. The trailer opens with an interior shot of Vault 33, an important location that we will be seeing a lot of in the show because it is where one of the main characters known as Lucy comes from. The circular shape of the hallway with metal supports is extremely similar to vaults we have seen in the series, like for example some of the hallways in Vault 111 in Fallout 4. This is a good example of the kinds of things that we will see often in this trailer, an eye for detail from the games that we hold so dear, and even if we can't point out the exact location, the precise object, or the exact character, it will feel familiar it will feel like it fits in the Fallout world. The next scene shows Lucy approaching the vault door with two others that are friendly and sympathetic, or at least they're not trying to stop her from leaving. This guy right here is Lucy's brother, which we only know because of the Vanity Fair article. They list the actor Moises Arias as Lucy's inquisitive brother, and looking the actor up confirms that this character is her brother. It isn't until a few scenes later when she is actually stepping out of the vault that someone is yelling for her to stop and we see a vault dweller that had been either knocked out or maybe killed near the vault door controls. Eagle-eyed fans had noticed this from a previously released picture, so we know there's at least some resistance to her departure. From the dialogue, we know that Lucy is not leaving under duress. She isn't trying to escape in order to save her life, and she even acknowledges in the trailer that she has led a relatively comfortable life within the vault. The Vanity Fair article sheds some light on why she is leaving though, which is said to be some sort of rescue mission. Has someone else from the vault left prior and she is concerned for their safety and therefore wishing to go out, find them and rescue them? Whatever this rescue mission entails, there are some within the vault that do not wish for her to leave but this could just be out of concern for her own well-being and safety. Lucy leaves the vault, and we get to see her reaction to the desolation that awaits her. This shot shows us some things that we have seen before in Fallout. The piles of bones littering the ground are likely the remains of people that desperately tried to get into the vault just before or after the nuclear bombs fell. We see this in Fallout 3 with Vault 101. A number of skeletons in the tunnel just outside of the vault door can be found along with signs that have messages like, help us, we are dying assholes, and let us in mother Additionally, the Vault 33 door looks extremely similar to the exterior door of Vault 76, with the three parallel lines making the vault door look like the Vault Tech logo. Now I do think it's important to acknowledge that Jonathan Nolan, or Jonah as he's often called, has worked on some of my favorite movies in the past, and he really likes the Fallout series, so his heavy involvement is to be celebrated for all of us fans that really want a great show. The trailer then shows us what the rest of the world looks like, and we know from outside sources that the game is meant to take place in the Los Angeles area, a place lovingly referred to in-game as the Boneyard. This shot seems incredibly similar to the real-world Santa Monica, more specifically Pacific Park, an amusement park right on the coast that is largely built out on a pier. The Ferris wheel is a dead giveaway, although its placement is different from the real world, but Santa Monica is in Los Angeles County, super close to where we know the show is supposed to take place. We see Lucy make her way through the destroyed world, and in this scene there are some white, what appear to be mummified bodies or body casts. I'm not entirely sure what this could mean, although we have seen dead bodies get mummified in Fallout 76, where some of those that had been infected with the Scorched Plague would eventually have their whole body ossified by Ultracite. 
with them standing, sometimes laying, frozen in place mid-gesture. We see a series staple, a rad roach, and the environment for this whole section is barren scorched desert. And Lucy even gets kind of freaked out by a tumbleweed, which is kind of great. Ah, they misspelled God Howard. How embarrassing. These scenes are played over lines from a new character that seems like he will be playing an important role. We aren't given any indication of who this person is that is speaking, but the Vanity Fair article gives us some more details. He is some sort of researcher who is named Wilzig, who is described as enigmatic, but is well accustomed to the brutality of the wastes, which he is heard lecturing Lucy about. It seems rather obvious that Wilzig is not a common wastelander. He has pristine clothing and is not scarred, haggard, or disfigured like so many wastelanders are, who are scraping by each day to survive. There is a quick scene where a dog is munching on a rad roach, and it's obviously part of this sequence where Lucy is speaking to Wilzig, so it appears to be his dog. Remember this dog for a little later. I don't really care about what other projects Amazon Studios has worked on, because while they have made some really good ones, they've also made some stinkers. I think the only significant thing to pull from the fact that Amazon is producing the Fallout TV show is that they will throw money at it. And while money will never make a bad show good, it can keep a good show from being great. So now we get a closer look at the Brotherhood of Steel that will be shown in the TV show. They are using the Fallout 4 and 76 style Vertibird, which we already knew, using T-60 power armor, which, again, we already knew, and introduces another main character known as Maximus. Again, we have no context to this character and have to rely on the article that recently came out. Maximus is confusingly referred to in this article as a squire, which is a title invented by the East Coast Brotherhood, but only applies to children born into the Order who may sometimes be taken on combat missions, but are only supposed to observe and learn, not fight. Unless there has been a change in titles for whatever branch of the Brotherhood this is supposed to be, a Brotherhood-appropriate description of Maximus is more along the lines of an initiate, because he is described as having to serve a superior Brotherhood member in order to prove his worth, valor, and strength. His superiors appear to be the power-armored figure that we see in the Vertibird, and is probably the same person seen in this picture which created a lot of hubbub, because, you yeah, know, the gun. I don't really care to comment on that because if I get all up in arms about Fallout 4's assault rifle not being realistic or accurate or make sense logically, then I'll have to go down a freaking long list of such things in the Fallout series. We get a quick scene of what appears to be the same dog we saw earlier, with Wilsig and Lucy being a good boy, with a human hand in his mouth, and it makes me wonder if we are going to get another actual dog meat who, as experience has taught us, likes to pop up occasionally in the series. And if not, then this is just another good boy. I do want to point out, though, how green the background is. So far, all we've seen is desert, sand, and blazing sun. So is Wilsig living or traveling far outside of LA proper, where there might be more greenery? This is his dog, after all. We get more shots of the Brotherhood, which we had seen before in a leaked teaser trailer, but I don't think there's much to say here except that every time we see Power Armor now, they seem to have the lens aiming apparatus thing down over their right eye. In game we see this on the Power Armor, but it's never adjusted down over the player's face, not even when aiming or in combat, so it's interesting that it always appears to be engaged. Now we get to some really interesting scenes here, because this jukebox getting splattered with blood in what appears to be some cornfield on a farm somewhere under a cloudy sky is not actually outside. The next scenes show without a doubt that this is in fact Vault 33. Here we see the corn and the other crops, and a windmill. And here we see that fake cloudy sky. So there are a number of things to say here. We know this is Vault 33 because of all the Vault 33 logos on the walls, and we're left to wonder if this indoor farm is how the vault supplies itself with food, or if it's part of the research they are supposed to conduct, or if it is part of the experiment being done on them. Vault 22 is a vault outside of New Vegas that was centered on agricultural research and developing crops that would be able to survive and thrive in a post-nuclear world. That, of course, ended horrifically with people being infected by spores that transformed them into spore carriers. But we can't be for sure at this point what the significance of the indoor farm is. 
except to just point out that it is unique amongst all the vaults we know. Now to the real spectacle, which is the incredible violence that is taking place in these shots. People are getting shot, thrown off of railings, and they are clobbering each other, but we don't know why. I would venture a guess that this violence is happening after Lucy leaves the vault, because there's just not a ton of urgency when we see her departure. If the vault had devolved into this bloody all-out war, it would make more sense that she, and probably a lot more people, would be desperately trying to get out in order to not be killed. So if this is the case, which there's no surefire way to tell, but we need to ask, why are they fighting? Could it be related to Lucy's departure? There is a precedent for this in Fallout 3, where the main character's father James leaves the vault against direct orders, which sparks a vault-wide lockdown, murders, crazed security guards attacking the player and gunning down dwellers who try to escape, and even a rad roach attack. Alternatively, this could be some sort of conflict that has arisen because of internal politics and strife, which is not unheard of in these vaults. Now we get some shots of the only settlement that we know of, one that is confusingly called Philly. We see Lucy coming to Philly in what is likely her first time, and there are several things to note. Off in the background we see the remains, dare I say, the bones, of long destroyed skyscrapers, so Philly is not far from pre-war LA. On the right as she walks in is the front fuselage of an airliner prominently sitting atop a roof. Now, there has been some discussion about this because of how similar it is to Megaton, specifically the crater side supply store. To me, I don't really understand the problem of having a settlement copy one element from another settlement that we have seen in the series. For example, as Lucy walks further, the building on her left with the smokestack and pipes running along the length looks very similar to the power noodle stand in Fallout 4's Diamond City which also had a smokestack with pipes running along the length that got wider down near the bottom. And look just to the left of the power noodle-like building at the ramshackle structure with a sign that appears to say supply using letters from different signs. This exact kind of design choice is lifted from the Prospector Saloon in Good Springs with the second part of the name consisting of letters taken from at least three different kinds of signs. What we are seeing here is not an attempt to rip off previous games but rather to evoke a feeling that this is the Fallout world. Like I said earlier in this video, often we can't put our finger on why something seems appropriate or feels distinctly Fallout. And this is often because it has been inspired by familiar elements of the Fallout games. That is what we're seeing here. And in a way, it's a nice fusion or marriage of the East Coast and the West Coast games, which up to this point has felt lacking. We see this close-up of a character that is called the Ghoul, something we have seen before in pictures and a leaked teaser, but the Vanity Fair article also fills us in on this character. He was alive in the pre-war, and we are supposed to see some of his pre-war life, and has become a legendary gunslinger in this area. You can see the sign we spoke of just before that says supply in the background, so the Ghoul is here in Philly, and we can see an interesting bullet on his bandolier. The bullet itself is red and seemingly kind of see-through, which is a round that we have never seen before in Fallout. Indeed, a picture from the article shows that his bandolier is filled with many different kinds of bullets of various colors, shapes, and sizes, although they all look to be the same caliber, which is good. It looks like the ghoul has some tricks up his sleeve and can pull out some rare, strange load that suits his particular need then and there. There is also something to be said about his appearance, which seems closer to the marked men than the ghouls we typically see. And the article attributes this look not to any lore or in-universe reason, but rather an artistic choice to not cake makeup and prosthetics on the lead actor's face. And you know what? I'm okay with that. We cut away for a few seconds to see Lucy stumbling through the desert and finding a man that would be me if I found myself in the Fallout universe. Confused and in my underwear. We're back in Philly, the ghoul can be seen absolutely wasting everyone with what is probably the lever action rifle that we see strapped to his back in the close up shots. I say this because in these sequences his back holster is empty as he is blowing away basically every person we can see in this town. This leaves us to wonder if he is killing everyone in this place or just a group of people that he has a beef with. 
The Vanity Fair article mentions that while he is ruthless, he does have a code of ethics. So I don't see him wiping out a whole town if they weren't all complicit in something that wronged him. I think it is very likely that this is where Lucy will meet the ghoul, a meeting that is implied to occur in the article. There is also a strange skull shown right here that I can't seem to satisfactorily attribute to any one fallout creature. I'd like to hear your suggestions though. We get an idea of the kind of violence we can expect with gratuitous blood splatter on the wall, which, to me, seems appropriate since Fallout has always had an over-the-top approach towards violence and gore. Now this scene is so interesting to me for a lot of reasons and I have speculated on this quite a bit since I first watched it. Lucy is shown sitting down at the desk of a vault dweller, who is surrounded by a bunch of vault tech branded clutter and takes a drink from a coffee mug that he has to spit out because it was, quote, the moldy one, all while Lucy is looking at him shocked and bewildered. Now the first question that crept into my mind was, who is this man? I think it is safe to say that he is an overseer. He is sitting at a desk in a room that has control terminals that we can see behind Lucy, while he is in a vault tech suit with a large vault tech flag. Most telling of all, however, is right behind him is the iconic circular window that we have seen through multiple vaults that always belongs to the overseer's office. It usually looks out into the main atrium to provide a view of the vaults that they are leading, like for example in Vault 81 or Vault 101. So we know he is an overseer, but before we can go any further, we have to address the eyeball. In what is a first, as far as I'm aware, we get an otherwise normal looking human with some sort of wild mutation or alteration because he has only one eye dead center over his nose. He's not missing one of his two eyes, he only has one eye. It is really interesting to think about this. What could have caused it and why does a vault overseer have this? We also need to ask ourselves, what vault is this? This can't be vault 33, could it? The Vanity Fair article lets us know that Lucy's dad is actually the overseer of vault 33 and we get a really quick glimpse of him in this trailer and at least one more picture in this article. Her dad and this one-eyed overseer only look vaguely alike from what I can tell, even if you cover up the super distracting one eyeball and the hair color and style is different. So either Lucy has found another vault that for some reason let her in and is still functioning enough to have an overseer, or this is her father in Vault 33 at some later date after something awful has happened. I trend towards the first suggestion, that this is a different vault because we have seen leaked pictures of a vault with NCR flags in the rooms, which Vault 33 doesn't have. Is this another vault that has information related to Lucy's rescue mission? Is this Vault 33 at a later date after something bad has happened? I would really like to hear your thoughts, but Lucy's bewildered and rather shocked expression would make a bit more sense in this context if she is encountering her father after a bunch of time has passed and he has mutated into a cyclops. The next scenes are quick but interesting, and I believe hook back to our character we have been discussing. A gun turret is seen spinning up and shooting at a target with a display that reads, please remain calm. Bethesda, we need displays on the gun turret's stat because that is hilarious. The turret is firing on a man that is obscured, but there are two crucial details here. The man is running with a dog, but not just any dog, the dog that we saw previously holding the hand and eating a rad roach. The other detail is that the man is wearing a white lab coat, and these two details definitely confirm that the person being fired on here is Wilzig, the researcher who was speaking to Lucy earlier. Some extra details here, the fence and facility behind the turret look to be in great condition, much better than anything else we have seen outside of the vaults. Also, there is snow. This is also massively different from anything we have seen at this point, and if you look at the scene where we see the turret and Wilzig, we can see snowy, jagged mountains in the distance. This is definitely not LA, but there is a large, jagged mountain range just north of LA that gets seasonal snow. It could definitely be the Sierra Nevadas, based on their appearance and being close enough to LA that someone could feasibly travel from here to the LA area. Knowing that Wilzig was a researcher means that he was either entering this heavily defended and well-maintained facility and got away, or what I think is more likely, 
he was working at the facility and decided to try and escape for some reason, and the automated defenses are trying to stop him. So what high-tech facility could he be from? What kind of research was he a part of? Is it related to this artifact that we know is being sought after by all the factions? If we look at maps from Fallout and Fallout 2, the Brotherhood outpost in the first Fallout is really close to the Sierra Nevadas and could conceivably get snow and have mountains visible in the background. That said, I don't think this is the Brotherhood compound. If this is any established location from the previous games, I think it is most likely that it is the Sierra Army Depot. Why? Well, the Sierra Army Depot is located smack dab in the Sierra Nevada mountains. It was a pre-war facility that conducted research in robotics, weapons, both biological and conventional, and artificial intelligence. A really relevant detail here too, is that in Fallout 2, the Sierra Army Depot is heavily defended by machine gun turrets and fences. No joke, there are seven different machine gun turrets and hordes of dead people who try to get past the gates. Now, even though this location is a dead ringer in so many ways, there are some complications. The Sierra Army Depot is not manned by any people when encountered in Fallout 2. It is being maintained by an artificial intelligence called Skynet and protected by robots and automated turrets. That would be enough to disregard this location, except that we know that the show takes place well after the events of Fallout 2. In fact, it takes place after the events of any known Fallout game in 2296. That is enough time for some group to have found the base and refitted it to suit their own purposes, resuming the pre-war research going on or engaging in new shenanigans. Now, it's totally likely that this is a new and never before seen location, but the similarities here are worth talking about. We get a quick scene of a Mr. Handy pushing a hurt or unconscious person sleeping that appears to be a woman in a blue vault suit. This could be our protagonist, Lucy, who has met Misfortune on her adventure, or someone else entirely. The ad in the background is for a brand we have never seen before, and the words that say, made in our own plant, almost makes it seem like the location they are in right there is this Dairy Fresh factory. I also just want to point out that the Mr. Handy is clearly the model from Fallout 4 and 76, but the eyes glow just like the versions we saw in Fallout 3 in New Vegas. That's more of this East meets West again that I am really starting to like. We get a quick flash to Lucy's father, the Vault 33 Overseer, and it seems that her decision to leave is not one that he agrees with, hence them staring at each other through some glass. We get some scenes of Maximus in some sort of engagement with his brotherhood comrades, one of which is likely his mentor, for lack of a better term, that was mentioned previously. The article mentions that Maximus is idealistic and fully devoted to the Brotherhood's cause, but is also concerned for his own safety and well-being to the point where he's kind of a coward, which we definitely get the impression of here. The battle seems to be taking place in some sort of settlement that they flew to on the vertebrate in the background, but the next scene where a Yao Guai is savaging a soldier in power armor is definitely in a different location. The first location had bare trees and no green to be seen while we get a lot more lush green vegetation here. A Brotherhood soldier, perhaps Maximus's mentor, is being attacked by a Yao Guai, Revenant style, and perhaps this is in the greener location where we saw Wills' dog with a severed hand. I do want to say though, that this Yao Guai looks really good, and I like that it seems so formidable, something Yao Guais have lacked in the past. Also, if this is around LA or in the Sierra Nevadas, this would be the most western point we have confirmation of for a Yao Guai, which previously was in Zion Canyon in Utah. There is a quick scene of what appears to be a woman running away with a metal briefcase. Is this briefcase significant? Is this the artifact? If it is, do you know what other really important pre-war technology looks like a metal briefcase? A Gek. I'm not saying that's what it is, but we should keep this in mind when we're discussing what this artifact may be. Now, two scenes that I think are freaking awesome. We get what appears to be a giant mutated axolotl roaring at the camera, and inside its mouth are rows and rows of hundreds of human fingers. Those are 100% fingers. They have knuckles, fingernails, and everything. And do you know what comes to mind when I think of combined animal-human mutated creatures? FEV. 
We have seen in the past how humans and animals can combine into horrific creatures with the Fallout and Fallout 2 centaurs, which sported both a human and a dog head that was only made possible through FEV. Is this giant axolotl the result of FEV mutation? Also, what's this rope looking thing on the right side? Was someone fishing in the lake that we see in the background and pulled up one of these bad boys? Who knows, but again, the background is so much greener than we are used to, and especially when compared to the rest of the trailer. The natural range of axolotls are around modern day Mexico City, which is far farther to the south than I think we can realistically expect to see in this show. But it did make me wonder how far south we might go. Will we see the glow? Can we make it as far as the US-Mexico border? Who knows? He knows. We get a quick scene back at Vault 33 that shows a woman who has been forked in the eyeball spraying the vault with a Sterling submachine gun, a weapon that has only been seen in Fallout Tactics. Another scene that garnered a lot of attention that we had seen before in pictures shows a massive Brotherhood airship that we know is named the Caswenin, which is a name from Arthurian legend which fits with the Brotherhood. The article also states that the people in the foreground are recruits, which makes sense given how they are dressed. But there are two things I want to point out. As has been discussed, the Caswenin appears to be a one-for-one -one copy of the Pridwin, which again, I don't really see as a big deal. I think it makes sense that the Brotherhood would work from established blueprints and plans that are known to function. And so the Brotherhood on one side of the continent would build a ship that looks the same as the Brotherhood on the other side of the continent. The things I haven't heard discussed much yet is that we only see airships when the Brotherhood is setting out on a large scale mission. When a number of vertebrates isn't enough and the distance is too vast to move a small army. The Brotherhood has used airships both in tactics to chase down the remnants of the Master's army and in Fallout 4 to move their fighting force from the Capital Wasteland to the Commonwealth to fight the Institute. This implies that the Brotherhood wherever they currently are here, are beginning or are in the middle of a large-scale journey. This could mean that the Brotherhood we see are not in the LA area, and therefore outside of the influence of the NCR. The NCR, which last we knew controlled Southern California, would not allow the Brotherhood to build such a large war machine. And indeed, the Brotherhood had been losing to the NCR in the NCR Brotherhood War. So could this be yet another sect of the Brotherhood from an area outside Southern California who are orchestrating a mission down to the LA area as part of this fight for a mysterious artifact. Only time will tell. Near the end here we get a quick shot of the ghoul before he has been ghoulified on October 23rd, 2077. Apparently he already had skills riding horses, dressing to the nines as a cowboy, and so becoming a western gunslinger that we see so many years later totally makes sense. We can guess that the girl on the horse with him is his daughter, which the article mentions, and the destruction happening behind them is Los Angeles being blown straight to Adam. The last shot is a panning one where we see Cooper, which is what the ghoul used to be named prior to his transformation, riding the horse with his daughter as Los Angeles receives at least five nuclear strikes. You can clearly see the Griffith Observatory, and even though Los Angeles has a different skyline, just like how Boston did in Fallout 4, we can surmise that based on the angle of the observatory, that Cooper and his daughter are right around this area. We even get to see a famous Vault-Tec billboard on the side of the road. So that is the end of my analysis of a two minute video. Why do I do this to myself? As always, I would love to hear your thoughts, observations, and your own theories as we piece together the information that we get from the leaks and revelations that seem to be coming at us pretty hard now. One thing I'm very excited about that I haven't heard people discuss with this taking place after Fallout New Vegas, are we going to finally learn what the canon ending is for New Vegas? Will we finally know whether the NCR, the Legion, or Mr. House is canonically victorious? I am stoked to see what we learn in regards to all the interesting groups here. Will we learn of Enclave Remnant groups? What about any super mutant remnants? Will we hear about the She and the Hobologists all the way up in San Francisco? Will we see or learn about Dayglow, the irradiated state that is mostly populated by ghouls? Man, I could go on about this for a while, but it is pointless until we learn more information and get to see the show itself. Thank you for watching, and thank you to my lovely patrons that support me as I toil away on my weekend to crank out an analysis video. And as always, please walk in Adam's glow. 
Remember that you matter, and I will see you soon with the normally scheduled programming.